So this question is from Lizzie. Lizzie asks, how does the promotion of the most right-wing MPs in the Labour Party and the demotion of most of the soft left fit with the thesis that Starmer will move left once in office? Well, I don't think it, it does fit. I don't think Keir Starmer will move left once he gets into office. What he will, will have to do, though, is probably, as we've discussed before, raise taxes or increase borrowing. That's what you're going to see. I do think this is basically... Uh, the completion, you could say, of Labour, um, sorry, of, of Keir Starmer's transition from that soft left uh, politician that won the leadership back in 2020 to this more, you call, you could call it pragmatic, but I think that's uh, diluting what it is. You could, it's more centrist, uh, Blairite uh, politician that's much more comfortable on the right of the party, and he's promoted people like Peter Kyle, like Pat McFadden, Liz Kendall. That Liz was that Kendall. was a shock. I came out from holiday and I saw Liz Kendall was in the shadow cabinet. That was a, a, a massive shock. She obviously run for the le- uh, ran for the leadership back in 2015 and got about. 4.5% uh, of the vote. On Liz Kendall, it's worth noting that Morgan McSweeney, um, Keir Starmer's uh, campaign director, and uh, Matthew Doyle, his current director of communications, were both involved in Liz Kendall's leadership campaign back then. It's also really interesting because uh, reshuffles are as much about the position that politicians get as it is about the broader party hierarchy. Some of these MPs on the right of the party, uh, they're in key position now to get promoted into the shadow, shadow cabinet maybe two or three years down the line. It's really important, these junior positions about where people end up uh, a few years on. I think it's a, it's an interesting question, this, from the listener, because it's almost this um, defining argument now that people are having on the left, which is, was Starmer a soft left politician who is... Um, moving more centrist or more moderate um, or more right-leaning, depending on on how you define him, in order to get power? Or was he always more of a sort of the Blairite faction and just sort of cosplayed being soft left in order to get elected? And I think people are asking, what's Starmer going to do in office? You know, is he going to revert back to the left? Does he know that the British public, you know, wouldn't vote for a, another left-leaning or soft left leader? But I think, I mean, you touched on this, Freddie, in your great column the other week about what Labour will do in office. And I think you're right. Eventually, Labour will have to either raise taxes or commit to more borrowing. And those are the things that are going to define Starmer and and where he sits ideologically. Um, but what we have seen from this particular reshuffle is, obviously, it's the March of the Blairites. We're seeing so many old Blairite faces and new um, centrist faces as well. So, for example, Darren Jones, I mean, he's very much kind of the sort of centre, he's managerial, he's um, got good friends in, in business. We saw him, um, the, one of the reasons he's been so impressive is he was chair of the Business Select Committee. And you saw him every week stick it to Amazon or the post office or whatever so we have these new faces as well and Starmer's really setting his stall out as this very sort of centre um, centrist Labour Party I think that's where he's firmly staying you know you've got Pat McFadden up there he's in charge of campaigns now this is what Labour's setting out their stall to be and I can't imagine he'll he'll defer too much from it when he when he gets to office if he gets to office. It's going to be a real challenge though because one of the reasons that Labour are so ahead in the polls isn't actually to do with what the Labour Party is doing at all. It's to do with how the Conservative Party are absolutely imploding. And all of these issues, as we've spoken about before, the key one this week being crumbling concrete in schools, all of these things, which were problems from the the early years of the 13-year Conservative government, uh, are really, really coming to the fore now. Crumbling public services, public sector pay, uh, the issue in the in healthcare, in in education, in infrastructure, in sewage, like all of these things, and Labour are being quite successful in looking at the Tories and looking at Rishi Sunak and going, "You guys are incompetent. You've let this all fall apart on your watch." And then you get the question, "Okay, so you're going to fix it, right, when you get into office?" But if you ask them that question, they are very, very reluctant to commit to more spending. You've had Rachel Reeves ruling out all kinds of of extra tax rises and okay, there'll be a tax on private schools and there might be a windfall tax on oil and gas. But these are really small numbers compared to uh, the the, the gap in uh, funding for for these sort of crucial services. So Labour, I think, are at risk of painting themselves into a corner where they get elected because the public voters want them to fix all these things, but they get elected having said that they won't raise taxes in order to fix all of those things. And I think in terms of the question, will they move left once in office? They're going to have to have a conversation where they look at the 
the figures, the finances and go, okay, we said we weren't going to raise these taxes, but look at our economic situation. We just cannot continue unless we do X, Y and Z. So I guess my prediction would be that there will be some new economic information that comes to light after the election where Labour say, you know, this is a new situation. It's a new crisis. We have to do these things that we said we weren't going to do because this new thing happened and it won't be a new thing. It will be stuff that we've we've known about for a while, but they will frame it as emergency tax raising powers because that's what the country needs. Whether you can call that moving left or just kind of moving in the only direction that you have, I, I don't know, but I think that's quite likely. I think it's interesting how Labour have responded to the, the rack crisis this week because Monday we, Parliament came back and it was probably one of the worst situations Rishi Sunak could imagine himself to be in. I mean, li- literally the idea of schools falling in on children's heads is probably one of the biggest political nightmares you can, you can have on your first day back of term. Um, and yet Labour decided to proceed with their reshuffle. And I thought it was interesting when various... Um, shadow ministers and, and and people in the Labour Party were asked about how Labour would respond. They were very touchy around whether they would, um, you know, produce more funding or how they would pay for it. You can see from Labour that there's still a lot of hesitancy around pledging money, even for something like crumbling school buildings, which arguably you think the public would be you know, if there was any public spending to be had, they would be in favour of schools being fixed. Um, but Labour have been really cautious on that too. And I think, you know, they're just so afraid of the taxation question because that has traditionally been Labour's downfall, their sticking point. Everyone thinks, you know, Labour's going to raise your taxes. Um, that they've they've stayed quite clear of it. And I think proceeding with the reshuffle, even on a, on a big news day like that, shows that Labour are still quite hesitant to stick the, the knife in too much when it comes to, you know, people asking them, well, how would you fund this? How would you pay for this? Yeah, I think it was a sign of Keir Starmer's authority and he's very happy to do that regardless of the news agenda. I also think it's not that surprising that Labour won't commit to uh, spending more money because they will definitely have to find a new tax, as you say, Zoe, uh, to pay for that. They don't want to get into that conversation yet, so they're not going to do so. In terms of the broader debate about their uh, fiscal agenda, the key thing that we always have to bang on about, and as we do, is the fiscal rules. They're not, I mean, we wouldn't expect them to make individual uh, spending commitments week on week until the next election. We need to wait until they have to rethink their whole approach to fiscal spending. Um, and as you say, Rachel, I think that will happen either before the, before the election um, or after, as some new economic data or the state of the public finances becomes clear because it it, it isn't sustainable Uh, and there's a contradiction between what they're going to have to do and um, what they're promising at the moment. Uh, Just going back slightly to the the reshuffle, there's some really interesting clues to what Labour might do in terms of Whitehall uh, and government within the reshuffle. Peter Kyle, uh, who was the Shadow Northern Ireland Secretary, he was handed the role of Secretary of State for the Department of Science, Innovation and Technology, uh, which was one of the three departments that Rishi Sunak uh, set up in the earlier in the year. There was lots of conversation within Labour about whether or not uh, Keir Starmer would keep that revert back to the more traditional Whitehall arrangement. The fact that he's given Peter Carl, someone who's reasonably close to him, um, and he's also well liked by who, who is seen as having done quite a good job in Northern Ireland. The parties there reasonably like him. He's a he's quite a good uh, media form as well. Giving that quite significant department to him, I think, is a vote of confidence. In the fact that. Um, technology is probably going to form quite a, a core basis of how Labour want to see their policy platform going into the next government. I also think it shows that Keir Starmer takes AI quite seriously. He does want this um, sectioned off as a separate department uh, and have someone dedicated to addressing that. That's something that the, both the government and Labour are um coalescing around. It's also something that Lucy Powell, who was one of the other contenders for the role, was criticised for. It, there was She'd been criticised in the past uh, for not having a coherent uh, Labour plan for AI. So I think that's one of the reasons that we're seeing Peter Kyle uh, get promoted to that role. I think that's a really interesting bit of analysis and not something I'd thought of before because I think when we see uh, Starmer and Sunak come head to head at the next election, one of the things they're really going to try and paint Sunak out to be, as in the Conservatives, is very sort of technocratic, very modern, very good at dealing with business, very good at dealing with tech. You know, he's a modern prime minister, whereas Starmer may not be. But Starmer, you know, putting Peter Carl into that position, taking that department seriously, I think he's ready to sort of go predicting that that might be an attack line on him and is ready to 
to kind of go neck and neck on that. So I think it's really interesting and it shows, yeah, that Starmer's probably seeing that that might become quite a big issue at the next election. And the other thing that Labour will try and do and or is already trying to do is painting Sunak as elitist and out of touch. And obviously uh, we've had lots and lots of sort of comments about his swimming pool and his wife's wealth and everything. But I thought there was a really, really savvy attack ad this week on the schools crisis where Labour spotted that Rishi Sunak as Chancellor cut funding for the rebuilding programmes of, of schools in the same spending review that he cut the duty on champagne. Now, in Sunak's defence, he was simplifying alcohol duty across the board and making it sensible in that the, the more alcohol is in a beverage, the, the higher the tax rate is. But he cut the tax on champagne. You've got this Labour ad of someone opening a bottle of champagne, which, by the way, Sunak doesn't drink because he's teetotal, um, but saying that, you know, he, he funded champagne as opposed to schools. And I think you're going to get much more of that um, kind of drawing on Sunak's personal background, but also linking it to decisions that he made as Chancellor. Thanks so much for watching. We'd love to know what you think. Please make sure you leave your comments below. And if you enjoyed watching this podcast, you can watch more of our videos on our YouTube channel. And don't forget to like and subscribe.